A short ceremony was held at the newly built Wuhan railway station to launch the official start of China's first high-speed passenger railway. The service links Wuhan, the capital city of Hubei province, in the Guangzhou, the capital city of Guangdong province, cutting travel time between the two cities from 10 hours to 3 hours. Wuhan's TV reporter Hu Li was there. I'm right now standing on the number one platform of the newly built Wuhan railway station. About three minutes later, I will get on the first train of the Wuhan to Guangzhou Express Railway with 1,200 passengers to Guangzhou, a city 1,068 kilometers away from here. While three hours journey last experienced China's first high-speed railway together. And the ride would be somewhat like this. For those of us in America, 385 kilometers an hour is about 240 miles an hour. And this is about 267 miles an hour. It's 11.50 Beijing time, we arrived at the Guangzhou North Railway Station, passing through 20 cities, over 600 bridges, and through 200 tunnels, which I think is kind of feeling like fly with your feet on the ground. The trip was pleasant and unveiled a brand new page on China's railway network, not only because of its latest technology, longest mileage, or fastest speed, but also the overall improvement of China's railway network. Hu Li and Li Jing for CCTV International from Guangzhou, Guangdong province. As you can see by this article in Popular Science, the vacuum tube train, a 4,000 mile per hour magnetically levitated train, could allow you to have lunch in Manhattan and still get to London in time for the theater, despite the five hour time difference. It's not impossible. Norway has studied neutrally buoyant tunnels, concluding they are feasible, although expensive. And Shanghai is running maglev trains to its airports. But supersonic speeds require another critical step eliminating the air, and therefore air friction, from the train's path. A vacuum would also save the tunnel from the destructive effects of a sonic boom, which, unchecked, could potentially rip the tunnel apart. So as you can see, the technology exists to even go 4,000 miles an hour in a train. This is Quebec City in Canada. It's about as French as you can get without actually being in France. If you're walking around taking in the sights, it pays to speak a bit of the language. So here goes. Mettre un pont devant notre. In English, that's just put one foot in front of the other, meaning the task at hand is quite simple. But for some people, even the natural act of walking can be an everyday challenge. Simon Bouchard is a 27-year-old PhD student. In 1998, he was diagnosed with cancer in his left leg. Despite a bone graft, the cancer returned, and three years ago, he lost his leg at the knee. Like many amputees, he now walks with the aid of a prosthetic limb. But his is unique. You see, it has a brain. Well, artificial intelligence to be exact and it does everything his right leg tells it to do. Here's how it works. Step one, wireless sensors, excuse me mate, transmit information from the sound leg to the bionic leg. Step two, that information is then processed by software embedded in here. It interprets Simon's intentions and creates movement based on the action of his sound leg. Step three, a naturally balanced walk. Standard artificial legs, known as passive prosthetics, have limited joint movement, which simply respond to pressure placed on them. You can see in the front-on shot on the left that Simon's action is not smooth. But when Simon is wearing the bionic leg, his gait is more natural. The battery-driven motors are providing the propulsion, and the sophisticated joints provide more shock absorption. 
And because the bionic leg is doing all the work, there's less wear and tear where the leg joins his knee, a common and potentially serious problem with passive prosthetics. The brains behind the brain, behind the leg, is Stefan Bedar, founder and executive vice president of Vitcom Human Bionics. Uh, I can show here maybe the frame of the prosthesis and more or less it's a very simple frame for sure. We have worked a lot on that because the weight of the prosthesis was a very important feature because we wanted to achieve the same weight of a natural leg which is around 4, 4.2 or 4.5 kilogram. It's a two-part system. A pad in Simon's right shoe monitors movement and pressure, making up to 1,300 calculations per second. This data is collected by a sensor on Simon's right ankle, which sends the information wirelessly to software embedded in the bionic leg. Actions like walking or climbing stairs are usually repetitive ones, so the information enables the motorised bionic leg to replicate the action and the speed of the sound leg. In practice, that means Simon can tackle everyday obstacles you and I take for granted. With the other leg, I have to, to climb this way, one step at a time, or two. But and you'd have to pull the other leg up. Yeah, but I, I can do it in a normal way, like this. That is fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. It's... It's a really natural gait down. Yeah. It'll take a bit of practice, but uh, yeah, it's more comfortable. Simon just needs to remember to start any new action, like climbing a stair, with his right foot, so the left one can then learn it. Yeah. Simon was one of about 20 who took part in the trials over 18 months. He's been using his bionic leg full-time for the past six months. For Stefan and his team, getting the leg ready for human use has been a long process. It took 15 years to design the artificial intelligence software and the hardware to carry it around. The team built this robotic simulator to help develop the most lifelike prostheses before trialling it on amputees. One thing interesting of this Bionic light, it's a finished product, it's something complete, but you know that's just the top of the iceberg. Yeah. And uh, I really, uh, I'm, I am really eager, eager, eager to, to see what uh, she will do in the future. They're billed as the world's first bionic fingers. They've been built by British scientists. The technology really is amazing. And... Uh, the folks at Touch Bionics tell me that it's only going to get better, and I can't even imagine anything more awesome than this. Eric Jones is one of the patients who've been testing them out in the trial stages. I can do things a lot faster, so I can fold laundry faster, um, I can pick things up and walk around, um, I can pick up my kid's Lego. They've been built by Touch Bionics, the same West Lothian firm which produced the bionic eye limb hand. Those fitted with the device will be able to bend, touch, pick up and point. The firm's marketing director, Philip Newman, says it has the potential to transform the lives of thousands of people with missing digits. The feedback has been fantastic. We've actually fit over 30 people now with ProDigit as a solution. And we're finding now that we've learned through the early stages of those fittings with uh, control strategies, coverings and all of the things that you expect when you're an early stage technology but we spend a lot of time working with patients and uh, other clinical professionals and we're very comfortable with the solution that ProDigits now represents. The ProDigits are custom made and fitted onto what remains of the hand. Sensors register muscle signals from the residual finger or palm. One of the things that makes them special is their ability to grip without crushing an object.